All right, here we are, College Baseball Daily, meeting on the mound, Gazala's son, Brian Foley. Hopefully we're joined by a couple of other guests coming up. It is a big week, ladies and gentlemen, in college baseball. We just had the regional round this previous weekend. We're moving up on the Super Regionals coming up, I guess, this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday for some. But, Brian, let's start out with the coaching carousel in college baseball. There was a coaching change at Wichita State, and there's a couple of different sides on this. But in the bottom line, they're looking for a new head man there for the Shockers. Yeah, you know, Gene Stevenson was there 36 years, and, you know, it's, it was getting time to start thinking about changing. You know, they got two Super Legion appearances, I think, since 96. But they really haven't done much in the last, you know, 20 years, so, you know, it's time to start looking, you know, whether or not this wants to be an elite program. If you want to be an elite program, you know, Final Four appearance this past year for Wichita State, and now they finally get rid of the legend, Gene Stevenson, so it's sad to see him have to go out as a firing, but he was offered to either resign or, you know, leave or get fired, and he, he decided to get fired because I uh, you know, that's what he wanted to do. You know, it's the famous thing. Jack Parker up here with Boston University, same type of thing. You know, legendary coach, you know, he decided to walk off on his own terms. You know, pressure was trying to build a BU also. So the same type of attitude. You know, um, I just reported about an hour ago, Mark Kingston at Illinois State is their number one target. So we'll just see if it comes up. But that's who they're looking at right now. Is this firing – kind of a changing trend in college baseball. I mean, we know since you started the site, obviously Brian, Brian Foley, editor slash publisher, College Baseball Daily, the exposure in college baseball has gotten a lot bigger over the last decade or so. Is that part of the issue? I mean, college baseball still isn't a, as huge revenue sport, obviously, when you compare it with baseball or with football, but the level of exposure of the sport is rising in circles, in media circles. Is that part and parcel of the issue now? You see a lot of these older coaches getting shoved out the door. There was an article. I tried to get Ian Massey. He wasn't able to join us, but UC Irvine, there were some rumblings about Mike Gillespie. Mike Gillespie's a legend in coaching college baseball. Has the game changed that much, Brian? Yeah, it's just that there's a totally different attitude in the game right now. You know, you got to be able to win and win now. You know, teams aren't waiting around anymore. You know, there's a lot of pressure at Ole Miss right now. So Mike Bianco's, you know, you know, He's not going to get fired, but there's a lot of pressure. People are starting to call off people's jobs, and this is the if you want to be a major sport, you this is what's going to happen. You know, coaches are going to start getting you know a lot more pressure because especially at Wichita State, which believes it's a revenue sport, which it is. A, Wichita, like Ole Miss, the SEC. You know, Scott Strickland taking over at Georgia this week. It is a revenue sport at some of these schools, and when it's a revenue sport, the pressure's high. All right, let's also jump to another story. Before we get to the back on the field, we've got Shotgun Sprouling joining us, the Southern California correspondent for College Baseball Daily. My name is Gonzalo Hassan. I'm here with Brian Foley. Let's jump to a couple of other stories. There's the Biogenesis story that's rocking Major League Baseball, but as you've reported on College Baseball Daily, connections on the collegiate level as well, Brian. Yeah, you know, um, I, we are the only national source that even follows that story at the college level because Jimmy Goings, who was the strength and conditioning coach at Miami for 10 years, um, was picked up, was mentioned in that report. Um, if you actually look at the report and see how many different plays with a connection to Miami. Ryan Braun, Miami, most, most, most specifically. Yeah, Ryan Braun's the biggest name. But if you look at, it, like, their number one starters, everybody was got picked up. You know, as Monty Grandal's been – I believe he's been suspended. Um, Yondo Alonso's also had some issues with um, steroids in the last two or three years. So the, Miami's program, you know, even though it's not directly happening to the program, it's all plays that are connected to, to Miami. So it's, you know, even the – what's the name of the ballpark at Miami? Alex Rodriguez Field or Alex Rodriguez Park. You know, I know AWA donated a lot of money to that program, but let's be honest here, it is, there's a major connection between that biogenesis clinic and the University of Miami. Plus, you know, the Frankie Rattler story a couple of years ago getting picked up with 19 vials of HGH on campus is ridiculous. And the kids, the start and second base in Houston right now, come on. I'm just being honest. Well, and you can read all about it on College Baseball yeah. Daily. Brian's on top of that. Shotgun Spradling, we have you in now. 
Um, your thoughts on Biogenesis and the University of Miami connection? I guess it's it's you're not going to be surprised. It's not just a professional and major league baseball problem. It's an overall baseball problem all through in terms of the performance enhancing drugs and HGH. Well, whenever there's a possibility of someone gaining an advantage, then they're going to do it because um, if you can boost your draft stock suddenly you're getting more money. If you can boost your performance in the minors, you're moving up and getting that, that uh, first major contract. If you can boost your performance in the majors, you're getting – it's all about the money. If you can if you can boost your performance and get away with it, then you're going to get paid more, and that's what it's all about. Uh, it's not about being fair. It's not about being, you know, um, keeping the – sanctity of the game or whatever it may be. Uh, baseball players have been cheating since baseball was started in, you know, the 1800s. Uh, if you can find an advantage, then you're going to, you're going to take advantage of, you're going to use that advantage and uh, try to win more and then get paid more. That's just the, been the nature of baseball since the beginning. And it's, uh, you know, move all the way down to uh, even the little leagues with Danny Almonte, you know, being older than he was. So, I mean, if there's a way to find an advantage, and the, the newest thing is performance-enhancing drugs, and even though that's something that's uh, dangerous and all these other things, then baseball players have shown time and time again that they will take advantage of anything that will give them that edge. Ask Pete Rose about the greenies. Ask Willie Mays about the red juice. It's been going on a long time in, in Major League Baseball. Um, but let's jump to one of the stories in college baseball, Jonathan Gray, from Oklahoma, who's playing in a Super Regional. We'll jump to that in a little bit. And expected to be one of the top three selections in the Major League Draft starts later today. He tests positive for Adderall. Now, I guess first of all, Brian, you had it on College Baseball Daily. It's not going to affect his status in terms of pitching in the Super Regional, but are there going to be repercussions about this revelation? There's not going to be much, you know, kickback on it because he's still going to be one of the top two, you know, two or three picks in the draft today. So we should see what happens. But I would doubt that drops his draft stock at all because, you know, it's only, you know, let's be honest here, out of all, you know, which is the ADHD drug. But, you know, we'll see what happens, but I doubt it even hurts him at all. You know, it's supposed to help you focus. I talked to a couple coaches around the game, like, you know, everybody takes before they play. So maybe we need to change the culture of the game if we're going to start, you know, if that's going to be the culture of the game, take Adderall before every game, the culture needs to change in the baseball world. All right, we're off to a good start. Brian Foley, Shotgun Spraddling, Gazal Hassan, College Baseball Daily, meeting on the mound. we got Super Regionals coming up, so let's jump to the field of play. The first story I want to throw out at you guys, in terms of the field in the Super Regionals, 16 teams, 14 one seeds, two number two seeds, does this mean the selection committee somewhat gets a bit of a vindication in terms of their selections coming out, or is it pretty obvious because the top, the cream of the crop, was always kind of a step above the rest of the field in college baseball here in 2013? I think it's just that the, this year was a very top-heavy year. I don't think I don't ever want to give the selection committee uh, any benefit of the doubt, but I think this one was an easy you know pick. It's not like uh, they're, they're the biggest – concern at the top was whether or not Oregon or NC State should get that, that final uh, national seed. And I think they messed that one up, apparent, uh, evidently, from the way things played out. So um, don't, don't ever give the selection committee uh, the benefit of the doubt. They're always wrong. There's always something they're doing wrong. <laughs> you can do that in every, in every sport. You can say that same thing. You know, in any sport, you can say the selection committee doesn't know what they're doing. So, But – you know, the, it's a top-heavy year. You know, there's pretty much 12 good teams in the country. I don't, I'm still not a believer in Kansas State. So, and um, I still don't think South Carolina is the top, you know, eight team in the country right now. But we'll see what happens this weekend. So, I think there's, like, good 12 teams that could actually legit win the College World Series. I don't think South Carolina is deep enough. But every time, every year when we have a go to the pole season, I always say that, and they always win the national championship. So what do I what do I know? What does anybody know? Actually? So they're actually hoping for you to say that every year. Yeah, you know, I you know I was the great I was the greatest you know the two years they won the national championship. I was like they're not going anywhere, and of course they won the national championship both years. So you know 
And so it's good when I say that for North Cal- uh, South Carolina fans. <laughs> of the 16 teams that advanced, guys, only three actually even lost a game. 13 of them got there on a three-game sweep. And three, uh, two of the teams that lost games were the one and two seeds. The other one was Mississippi State. They lost a game in the Starkville Regional. They were three and one in that regional. Let's jump right to the top. North Carolina had to play an elimination game on Monday against Florida Atlantic. The game went to extra innings, and ultimately they knocked off Florida Atlantic. Uh, let's jump to that series. How serious was it? Obviously, Florida, Florida Atlantic, they won three games in that regional. How huge would it have been for the Owls? who were a two-seed to have knocked off the Tar Heels. I mean, boy, boy what a uh, ridiculous game on Monday. That game just, just – wow. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even get to start watching it until in extra innings. I didn't even catch the ninth inning that where uh, Florida Atlantic hits a grand slam, goes up by a couple runs, and then North Carolina comes back and gets a couple in the bottom of the ninth to tie it up, send it. The extras, the game goes, I think, to the 12th inning. Both teams score three runs. And then, wow, it just kept going. And just you didn't want it to end because it was, it was uh, such a fun game. And uh, everyone had something to yell about on Twitter, whether it was the, the usage of pitchers or just the fact that some of the pitchers that were being used couldn't throw strikes. I mean, uh, it was it was a heck of a game. And that would have been a the, the biggest upset in the country, I think, because – that was such an easy regional. Florida Atlantic was the only team that even had a shot in that regional, I think, in North Carolina, and not a very good shot at that. But they played – got to give them a ton of credit because they played so hard in that game. Coming back in that ninth inning, you just had to feel – you know you know that there's just going to be tears all the way back to, uh, to Fort uh, Lauderdale or Fort Myers, wherever, uh, wherever Florida Atlantic is at. Somewhere uh, near Fort Lauderdale. I don't know the exact Fort Lauderdale, area. I think it is. One of the four. It's a fort yeah. down uh, but you just got to feel bad for them. You know that you know they're just heartbroken going back. Uh, you know, especially Silvestri, their senior pitcher on the mound, um, couldn't get it done there in the extra innings. Couldn't hold on the lead, and they they'll be going home. You're gonna reflect on that one for probably oh just the rest of their lives or so. You know, and uh, North Carolina survive in advance. The Tar Heels were who they thought they were, and they let him off the hook. Shotgun, let's jump in. You mentioned the Twitterverse, kind of blew up about the pitching. Is this a problem in the NCAA? Obviously, this was a different case in that they had a couple of games go to extra innings, and they, in essence, ran out of pitchers. You're not going to throw kind of some of the pitches at the end of the bullpen in an extra inning game where you could get eliminated for the year. There was the same issue brought up with Georgia Tech starting their starter who had thrown on Friday. Granted, he'd only thrown 58 pitches. Um, is it somebody? Because a couple people were commenting that this is kind of the ugly side of college baseball. And you and I and Brian, we talk to coaches a lot. And I talk to a lot of coaches who tell me, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that aspect of it. Because, they, you know, obviously if a kid gets drafted and hurts his arm, he's got whatever money he's made from that team who's paying him. Whereas that's kind of part of the balance with college baseball is, yes, you want to win – but do you want to win jeopardizing somebody's professional potential? You know, I asked it, asked it on Twitter a couple times, and um, I'm an old-school type of guy because I, because I didn't throw hard, I could throw every single day. Um, I threw sidearm, so I was like David Berg style, you know, I'm ready to go every single day. You were, you were like David Berg aesthetically. Yeah, I was like David Berg without the good stuff. <laughs> So, uh, but I could throw every day, you know, I was ready to go. I didn't ever get to throw every day in college because I didn't throw well enough, evidently. But, uh, you know, I, I'm that type of guy where I'm fine with going, you know, especially if you have a senior who's not a big prospect or something. Uh, my best friend went 140 pitches, came back on no day's rest in the championship game, and threw two innings and got the win. You know, that's the, you know, that's the culture that I'm used to. And I believe the more you throw, then the less you're going to be hurt. I asked the question, I was like, what are some good examples of guys that are thrown on short rest being injured? And I got no responses. So I can't think of any. It's usually not the throw on short rest and then, then they get injured, you know, a uh, couple of, It's the over usage repeated, repeatedly, the too many innings on the arm throughout the course of the season rather than 
one time jumping in there and and, and throwing um, on short rest. And a lot of times, you know, if someone were to look and do a study on it, a lot of times pitchers aren't effective then. So are you, is your pitcher, is uh, Kent Emanuel, you know, is he at 75% better than a bullpen guy that, that's, you know, and North Carolina had some bullpen guys that didn't throw that have been uh, solid guys for them this year. That was what I was more concerned about. Is Ken Emanuel at 75% or 70% or 60% coming back on, I think, two days rest, is he that much better than a guy at 100% in your bullpen who you relied on during the season? That's what I'm more concerned about. Now, like the Buck Farmer, I was perfectly fine with that. 60 pitches, you're going to throw a bullpen. Definitely it's going to be a different intensity. Uh, that's one of the things because some people try to claim, oh, well, he's going to throw a bullpen. It's the same thing. There's a different intensity. Let, let's go ahead and throw that out there. Um, but do you, you're going if you keep him on a tight leash, and Georgia Tech pretty much did that. They didn't let him go. I think he threw uh, 65, 70 pitches uh, the, in the start against Vanderbilt. You know, I'm, a, I'm perfectly fine with that because as long as you maintain it, control it, and it's not something that's repetitive, then is it's not that big of a deal to the arm, in my opinion. Now, granted, I'm not a doctor. I just, you know, I've been around the game a little bit. That's about it. Um, so, and if someone can come up with some good, good examples of, you know, guys that are thrown on short rest, and I'm willing to listen to it. Uh, but, but my biggest, my biggest example is Austin Wood at Texas. There, he's gone through so much arm issues since that legendary game in 2009. I mean, I think he blew out his arm after the season. You know, after the college season came back, he never pitched that whole summer again. After that, 13 in appearance as a closer, coming in and pitching 12, 13 innings. Now that's a, a now pitch. that's a little bit different. Um, that's a little bit different. So because because you're not just throwing a short. Re- that's not short rest. That's completely changing. Your um, what the arm is used to now a closer and, and a couple people on Twitter were complaining um, about FAU the usage of FAU's closer Florida Atlantic's closer rather than about UNC bringing guys back on short rest. That's a completely different issue in my mind because you're changing what the arm is used to. You're not just bringing somebody back because a starting pitcher. Their arm is used to coming back a couple of days later after a start and throwing again because you throw a bullpen. That's something normal in the process to get the lactic acid out, get everything going towards that next start. Whereas a closer, you know, being a reliever in college, I threw, you know, uh, if I didn't pitch and I throw a bullpen, I'm throwing at the most, you know, 40 pitches or something in between games and stuff like that. I don't come back and throw a 120-pitch outing in the bullpen or in, in between games. You know, that's not something that's normal for the, the pitcher at all. So that is a complete separate issue in my opinion. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other issue in that huge UNC game the other night was I think UNC blocked back their Sunday starter to pitch the last inning in that game. So pitching the kid the next day is pushing it out to throwing 100 pitches. So I thought that was more of an issue than Ken Emanuel. And, and Ken Emanuel was not very good, let's be honest. And they brought him back, I think, uh, I think. are you referring to Johnson coming back? And he, I think he threw to one pitcher, I mean to one batter, and then yeah, he was but, done because – like I said, people aren't effective that quickly exactly. returning. Yeah, so he, you they, don't, let's be honest here. Mike Fox didn't bring him in just to face one batter. He wanted him to go a lot longer, but he couldn't. Yeah, I mean, and he, so, yeah. what he did is he walked the guy, I think, on yeah. five pitches. So yeah. if I remember correctly, so you see immediately this guy is not the same pitcher that you know has been our starter all year. So that's, that's what I'm questioning. Why are you bringing in a guy who's going to be 60 to 70% is he that much better? Now, if you have, for example, San Diego State, when they had Steven Strasburg, and uh, Strasburg, I don't, not that I know of, was brought back on short rest ever because uh, they got put out so quickly in the regional. But if you have a guy that you know is the legit 1-1 pitcher compared to your rest of the staff, he might be that, that much better at 60% than the rest of your staff. But yeah. how many times is that the case? Even if you have an ace that's a MLB guy, if you're a program like North Carolina, you have depth in the in the bullpen. Use it. I agree, straight up. Use to use your depth. There's no reason. There was no reason for Ken Manuel to come back. Ken Manuel's a gonna be a first round pick or an early second rounder. So 
is it, it's not worth the damage, you know, because the damage that was done was everybody's talking about Mike Fox having a tradition of now overusing pitches. So that's going to be the biggest thing. And that goes back to the, uh, you know, what, 2006, I believe it was, when he used the guys uh, over and over. Yeah, you don't want to get that reputation as a coach because it goes – it also hurts you recruiting, let's be yeah. honest. Here. It's going to hurt you recruiting. You know, even if it's not even true, it's going to hurt you recruiting because now that was on ESPN all day that, you know, he used these guys and everybody in college baseball now thinks, oh, he's in, he overuses um, pitchers. You know, Augie's got a – Augie Garrido's got a huge tradition of doing that. Mick Aoki in Notre Dame now has that because of one game against Boston, against Texas, that 25 in games. Aoki, anytime you talk about Aoki, Keith Law goes, oh, Hey, Mick Aoki, he overuses arms. you got to watch out for that. So now he's got a reputation at Notre Dame. So. Well, you know, a 25-inning game I think is a little different because yeah. there's no way you can really prepare. You know, you're playing three games in a day. You're probably going to have to deep dig deep in that. You know, that's one of those yeah, – you know, yeah. talk about deep cuts. We're but, talking about Mike – but we're talking about Mike B- Belfore who pitched nine innings as a, as a closer, and we talk about Austin Wood who's got 12 innings. And they just kept – throwing them out there, you know, from, like, I think the eighth inning to, like, the 20th inning. That's pushing it. That's pushing a lot of innings. You know, I think that's what happened with those two. You know, I mean, I, I called a couple of games this year where it just got away, and you're trying to get somebody to, as they say, wear yeah. it a little bit. So you go to the back of the bullpen, and sometimes you have these kids who haven't maybe thrown any more than 20 or 30 pitches in a game going 90, throwing 90 pitches just because you know, you're behind 12 to nothing. You need somebody to throw some pitches for a while. Yeah. And the kid wants to throw because they want to show they, they get more time. Maybe they haven't pitched in a couple of weeks, so they're not going to beg out of the ball game. And I, I saw that happen a couple times this year. Um, and, you know, luckily nothing seemed to have happened. Both pitchers, obviously, you know, in high school and whatnot, they're used to being starters. So they come in and they're, you know, maybe they haven't stretched out during the year, but they want to earn those extra time. But this is actually a different scenario in that probably in a – in an elimination situation, you're not going to go that deep into your bullpen. You're going to go with guys who you think can can have it, can, you know, can 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 maintain that that or keep the lead intact or maintain the deficit. I mean, Chuck and we were at LA. We saw Michael Wagner come into the game and finish it for uh, University of San Diego. He entered the game in the first inning, and I believe ended up pitching seven and two thirds. Now, a little different scenario in that he hadn't pitched the, the night the day before, and he had started during the year. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all about what your, your pitchers have done in the past and what the arm is used to. Now, for example, Wagner, the previous year was the closer, um, and they tried to, at the very end of the year, move him to into the starting rotation. He made one start, and then he was starting in the regional. Uh, and this year, he was their ace for the majority of the season, and at the end of the season, he became their closer. He's used to those long innings. He went five and a third as, as their closer um, a, a couple weeks ago. You know, if the arm is already built up for it, it's not that big of a deal. Now, if he was, if it was last year and he hadn't made any starts or anything, uh, when he only when he had one start, I think he went three or four innings against Irvine uh, at the very end of the season before the regional, then it would be a, a completely different story to me because you just can't build up that quickly. Now, if you see the guy progress, you know this is why in spring training they start out and they throw thirty pitches in the first. Uh, outing or whatever it may be, and they build up to the 100 pitch. And then, you know, sometimes teams are even cautious at the beginning of the, the regular season. This is after a month, a month and a half of spring training on how many pitches their, their, their starters will go at the beginning of the year. For me, I'm more concerned not with a guy coming back on two days rest and throwing a relief appearance, but I'm more concerned with a team, and a lot of high schools do this, is if you have an ace and you throw him out there and all of a sudden he's going 130, 140, 150 pitches on consecutive outings on, you know, repetitively uh, going this many, a lot of pitches and putting – that's where the tax comes on the arm and on the, the rest of the body as well. Because you can watch especially high school pitchers when they're not – they haven't really filled out the body completely. You can watch and the mechanics break down so much as soon as the guy gets tired. You know, you can see it so quickly, and but a lot of uh, coaches will just ride their ace because they in in high school your ace at seventy percent is a lot of times going to be a lot better than anybody else on the team if you have a, a legit ace. So they'll just keep riding them and riding them, and that's you know a lot of times can be very dangerous for the players. Any thoughts, Brian? 
you, you look at the culture difference between Japan. You know, Japan has guys, you know, Japan high school baseball is totally, you know, is a big deal. It's like you college know, baseball here almost. It's like, yeah, I would even put it, it's, it's a little, maybe even a little bit bigger than college baseball over here. You know, it was a high school kid the other day that pitched like five games in like nine days. to like 772 pitches over five days. So, you know, it happens. But the problem is, is the culture over in Japan is to throw, throw, throw. And over here, it's more like to baby the arm. So, I, you know, do go ahead, Chuck, and what do you want to question? Uh, well, another thing that adding to what you're saying is that um, you know I've read a bunch of stuff on, on Satchel Page through, through, going through, and one of the ways that he made money is he bounced around from team to team and would throw six times in a week. He would only throw throw like three or four innings and then make an appearance, go through the entire lineup, and be out of there, get his money, and be gone. But the difference is they weren't throwing a 100% at all times. You know, they, uh, these guys are throwing 100 miles an hour. Michael Cedaroth, I took a picture when he was pitching against uh, San Diego on Saturday, and you just see the ligaments and the, everything in his elbow just, you know, popping out. Uh, when you're throwing 100 miles an hour, it's going to put a lot more tax on your arm than if you're throwing 85 or if you're throwing 90. I mean, it used to be, you know, 10, 15 years, if a guy was hitting 90, and you're like, whoa, this, is, this guy's throwing hard. Now, 90 is nothing. Everyone is, like, uh, last year I was talking to someone about the draft, and I was like, oh, the guy's 91, 93, and he's right-handed. Everyone's 91 to 93 and right, and that's right-handed. So if, you, if you're not above 93, then, you know, you're just one of the masses now, whereas it used to be 90 miles an hour is a big, you know, real big deal. Um, so it puts more tax on that arm because the, the ligaments necessarily haven't gotten that much stronger to go along. I don't think they've caught up, um, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these injuries. And I'm just completely hypothesizing here. No, no significant studies to back this up. But you know, the guys like Satchel Page, they didn't have, they didn't throw 100% at all times. And the culture that we're in, I think the difference between the U.S. and Japanese culture, I don't think Japanese pitchers throw 100% all the time. They throw a lot more, a lot of different pitches and try to use deception rather than trying to blow by people. And I think that's a, definitely a cultural difference. Rather than guys pitching, it's pitching to a radar gun. Yeah, absolutely, especially at the college level. These guys are, like, they're thrown for the radar gun. Instead of trying to get guys out, they're trying to blow guys away. And that's, you know, you're absolutely right about that. They're trying to, to, to do too much for the scouts instead of showing pitching skills. If you got a guy throwing 90-91 right-handed that gets guys out, he's not going to get drafted. But, you know, he touches 94-95, you know, he's the greatest thing in the world. It is totally different attitude. Kids throwing 90 miles an hour right-handed that gets guys out, won't get drafted, but the difference, that's a huge difference in the cultures of the two. Yeah, you, you think about, you know, Greg Maddox coming out of high school. Um, now, granted, Greg Maddox could get it up to 90, 91 uh, in his career, but you think about him coming out of high school, if he were to be drafted now, you know, if he had the same exact, you know, arm strength, you're like, this guy's going to be, I think he ended up being a second-round pick, could be incorrect about that. Uh, pretty early in the draft when he was drafted, but if he was drafted now, he's you know maybe somebody takes a chance on him later and gives him an opportunity, but um, because they can see that he can pitch, but it's not going to be a high draft pick. It's going to be something down the line, um, and that's just the the change in the culture of baseball. I think when we're paying more attention to, well, if the guy you can't teach 100 miles an hour, but if the guy can throw 100, maybe I can teach him how to pitch rather than wow, this guy can already pitch, um, and he shows that he, he's got the ability to mix his pitches, do this type of thing. Well, I can't teach him how to throw 100 miles an hour. It's all about what, what you can, you know, all these reclamation projects from guys that can throw hard. I remember the Georgia Tech closer probably five, six years ago. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but he could throw 100 miles an hour, had no clue where it was going. And he got picked up by like six different minor league teams, even though he had, I believe, more walks than innings and uh, maybe even double, uh, like one and a half to the two walks per inning average in his minor league career and was terrible throughout. But because he could throw 100 miles an hour, everybody was like, hey, I can fix that guy. There, there, was, there was at least one person in the organization that thought, we can fix him. Oh, we got this. And then he gets picked up by another team and another team, and he never did anything. Yet there's guys out there that, you know, they get hit around a couple times hard throwing 90 to 92 
and all of a sudden they're out of the minors and, and they don't get a second opportunity. All right, guys, College Baseball Daily meeting on the mound. Uh, Shotgun Spradling, Brian Foley. We are joined. I, I pride the show on being we – have, we have three top – well, not two at least, regional accents. We're going to bring in a third from the <laughs> Chicago. Um, Adam Amin, uh, ESPN, he got a chance to cover that Tallahassee regional. Adam, first of all, welcome. Thanks. For, I know it's busy. You barely know where you are with all your travel. Thanks for jumping on with us this morning. Guys, I appreciate you having me. I really do. All right, from the comfort of your own bedroom there, um, you were at Tallahassee. We've, we've been jumping around about the games. Um, I thought Troy had something going into the tournament. They managed to win a game, but in the end it was the Seminoles. It was a pretty chalky Super Regional. You were there. What were some of the outstanding things you saw? Obviously Florida State kind of rolled through that Regional, did they not? They did, and they did it a year ago as well. And what, what I would imagine – is going through Florida State's fans' minds right now. They're getting ready to take on an, an Indiana team that can put up a lot of offense, uh, and, and we've seen that in spurts over the course of the season. But last year, kind of the, this is shaping up to be very similar to what it was a year ago because Florida State last year came into the regionals 4-8 and eight in their last 12. They didn't win a game in their ACC tournament in pool play, and then they pretty much just blew through. I mean, there was a, there was a close game in there against Sanford a year ago, but their pitching staff was so good, and their offense was just so inc incredibly consistent over the course of those three days. And then they go into a Super Regional with Stanford and Mark Appel with a head of steam, and they crushed them. They crushed Stanford a year ago and made Appel look bad. It was a 35-9 to or 35-8, to something like that, outscoring in two games of Stanford, which was considered a very good team a year ago offensively and obviously had a great pitching staff to go along with it. So... Uh, it's shaping up very similarly because Florida State's starting staff was so dominant in the three games uh, that we saw. And Brandon Liebrandt, who I saw a year ago as a freshman, he was a freshman All-American last year, this year his regional outing was not all that good. He only went, uh, I want to say it was five innings total, and and wasn't as sharp as, as we've seen him over the course of the last couple of years. But his offense gave him so much support. Florida State scored double-digit runs in all three games. And I was worried going into this weekend or this past weekend about Florida State's offense because they lost so much from a year ago it, between Jace Boyd, who's having a great year at, in the Sally League for the Mets, between James Ramsey, who turned down a decent amount of money from the Twins to go back to school, and then he got drafted in the first round by the Cardinals. They didn't have their leadoff guy in Sherman Johnson, so they've had to fill the gaps up top with a guy like Josh Dell or maybe even Seth Miller. And – wasn't sure where they were going to find offense from consistently over the course of the season because their numbers weren't great this uh, this season going into the NCAA's. They were dominant this weekend, and and let's not get it twisted. Troy's got a good pitching staff. They had the pitcher of the year, and granted, Florida didn't see him. And and Savannah State, uh, I know they're not a sexy name, guys, but Kyle McGowan is the hot name on everybody's lips. He got beat up a little bit in that outing against Florida State, and I do think he's going to bounce back, and I do think he's going to make a, a minor league organization pretty happy, and, and maybe he'll have a shot to move up to double-A AA or triple-A maybe in the next four years. But uh, I think a lot of concern was with Florida State, and rightfully so, and, and they proved everybody wrong. You know, uh, Adam, uh, i, I got to give you guys credit because, you know, I take my share of shots at ESPN, but i got to say that base is loaded coverage was outstanding. It was fantastic. I didn't get a chance to watch it all four days because I was back and forth to games. I did watch you call that Troy game. I believe it was Friday morning. And then I watched the, the wraparound coverage on Monday. And I thought ESPNU and ESPN, the whole family of networks, did an outstanding job in terms of covering college baseball and, more importantly, getting guys in there who kind of had done their homework and knew college baseball and kind of bought new stuff to the fans. That Monday coverage for those elimination games was just fantastic. Yeah, and, and, and I was really proud to be a part of it. I'm, I'm really happy that we, we decided to, to kind of innovate a little bit and do something different and take a risk. This was a big risk when we were leading up to it. and I, you know We were all sitting in on the conference calls, and, and not every uh, site had high-definition cameras, and not every site was using a big-time television truck. It was you know, a little TriCaster, which is you, know, you just plug in about three or four different cameras, and you switch from camera to camera. It's like, a, it's like an eighth-grade setup compared to what these guys on – on the Super Regionals and the College World Series have, but I was so impressed and I was really proud to be a part of it. Our guys in studio did a phenomenal job. Anish Schraub, Dari Noka, Kyle Peterson, they kind of anchored the coverage all weekend long, and, and it, it, the best comparison we got was it's NFL Red Zone for college baseball, 
and that could not be more accurate of an al of an analogy, and it could not be a bigger hit. When Red Zone came out, everybody loved it for for all the right reasons because they were taking you to the best action. Whatever was good, they were going to show it to you. Whatever was big, they're going to keep uh, flashing back and forth. And I was really proud that uh, a we pulled it off because you know I was in a standard uh, site. I had the big TV truck, and we had high definition, and we were on TV out of uh, half our half of our games. But some sites were strictly on the internet. Strictly on ESPN three and getting some coverage on bases loaded. Everybody from from top to bottom, from uh, Eugene to Tallahassee, made it work. Hey, uh, we're with Adam Amin, ESPNU, who was part of that bases loaded coverage over the weekend. I got to ask you: Had Valpo advanced, there had to be a rule that you had to call that one, correct? <laughs> you know, it's funny too. They would have been in Tallahassee, so uh, I, I would have been okay with doing it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had already seen Florida State this past weekend, and and I'm I'm thankfully I'm on summer vacation and and. And I'm uh, I'm happy to to watch from the bench now and and kind of kind of see how this all unfolds. But you know I was really proud of uh, of what Valpo was able to do as just as an alum, you know you know as as an objective college baseball broadcaster. I'm sure I would have gotten over it, but uh, I was really impressed by what Tracy Woodson has has his team doing, especially bouncing back after losing to Indiana on, in really heartbreaking fashion. That was that was an opportunity for another one seed to go down. You know, Virginia Tech lost. In Blacksburg to Connecticut, uh, you know, and only two number one seeds, including Oregon, had had dropped the game in the first 32 games. And Indiana could have been that third uh, if, if it had not been for a phenomenal comeback. But I was really proud to see what Tracy Woodson has done just in the last two years, back-to-back -back NCAA tournament trips, and that's been a rarity for Valpo. And it was their first uh, win uh, in an NCAA tournament game in 47 years, and it happened to come against a team I know that was struggling, and, and a lot of people were shocked that they got in, but against a big program like Florida, that's a big win. You know, the big thing with Valpo is that um, kid Tana, um, Tana Vavea, you know, Barbara. with his, um, yeah, yeah, with the one with the one eye, that's an absolute great story that the kid's able to, you know, play college baseball. And Absolutely. probably he should be getting drafted either second day or third day. We'll see what happens this weekend. And he's got a good pedigree too, Brian. He's uh, His dad's uh, a member of the Minnesota Twins organization yeah. and uh, – and a great hitting coach, and, and Tanner's a fantastic story, and, uh, and he's part of that great run for Valpo this year. You know, a couple things, Adam. Just uh, getting back to Tallahassee, um, it seemed like, the, the, you know, the Southeast is big in, in terms of college baseball, and the atmosphere there seemed like it was really, really top shelf. G g give us a little bit about kind of how, ju how juiced it was with the teams that were there, because there were a couple teams, Troy and Alabama, kind of thinking about making a run, and then obviously the home team held serve, but seemed like a really good atmosphere for college baseball there in Tallahassee. And that was something that we got, that we got with this bases loaded coverage, too. We got a chance to see some of the best atmospheres in the country that you don't get a chance to see, and, and, and I'll, I'll put, th this is just a general outside perspective looking in real quick. Oregon... Mississippi State, LSU, NC State, Florida State, those are five that stick out right away. You know, Duty Noble Field in Mississippi State, my good friend Joe had a, had a chance to call uh, that regional, and, and he said the atmospheres over the course of the weekend were incredible. I've been That's Joe, Joe Davis of ESPN does an outstanding job. Yeah, he's, he does great work, and, and he's been in the South. He, he worked in Alabama and did minor league baseball out there, so, you know, he's familiar with the Southeast, and he's never seen a, an atmosphere until he saw this past weekend in Starkville. Uh, I was in Eugene for the Super Regionals a year ago, and they hadn't hosted a Super Regional in ever, so it was a big deal there. And their fans packed their, the park. It's a minor league baseball park where the Emeralds play, uh, the Padres affiliate, and they absolutely just went nuts. They broke attendance records. Florida State has the Animals. If you've never heard of the Animals, look them up. They they have this great tradition. They have a song book, which goes about 45 pages, and, and they sing, Oh, Canada, in the bottom of the fifth because it's something that happened a few years ago and they made a rally because they decided to sing it or, or whatever. There's all these great traditions that go along with it. Alex Box Stadium in Baton Rouge, they pack the place every time. That's probably going to be the most electric atmosphere that you're going to find with LSU and Oklahoma this, this coming weekend. But, I mean, it, it's so impressive to walk into a college baseball park, not really know what to expect, and all of a sudden it sounds like a football game. You know, the, the, the crowd's just constantly cheering. There's, there's just an underlying O from the crowd constantly over the course of the game when the home team's doing something. When uh, a pitcher's got two strikes on a, on a hitter, fans are on their feet, they're clapping, they're cheering, they're chanting, and, and there's a very high sense of education when it comes to college baseball for fans of Florida State. Uh, I think for Eugene as well, for Mississippi State, all these, all these places, and I'm just naming those, those four or five, and, and it's all across the country, and I'm glad that people finally got a chance to see that 
over the course of the weekend because it's, it's not very often that all at the same time you get a chance to see all these postseason sites and how into it the fans are, and it's a blast. And yeah, again, we're talking with Adam Amin from uh, ESPN, ESPNU. He was at the Tallahassee Regional this past weekend, College Baseball Daily Meeting on the Mound, Gazal Hassan with uh, Brian Foley, Shotgun Spratling. Before we let you go, before we let you fade into that Chicago morning, I guess, Adam, um, give me some thoughts on the overall, uh, the overall competition that first weekend. 14 one seeds, two two seeds, but we did have some compelling regionals. I believe only three hosts. Uh, the three hosts that uh, three of the th uh, of the fourteen hosts that advanced lost the game. Everybody else kind of went straight through. Were there any? Were there any? Were there any big uh, stories you took out of that first weekend? You know, I think uh, obviously J the Jonathan Gray stuff is sticking out just because of of what it means to the game. And and I agree with you guys. You know, you, you guys were talking about changing the culture of college baseball. If this is something that that guys have to do to focus or whatever it is, and again, it's he's not doing anything illegal, but. This this could become a problem in the future. The reason you guys, uh, a reason baseball tries to put the kibosh on this type of stuff is because it could become a, an issue for younger players. You know, the steroid issue. They're a bunch of adults. Let them do whatever the heck they want to do. And listen, I'm not a I'm not a proponent of it, and I don't I don't support that, and I don't I don't think it's I think it's a terrible thing for the game. But the biggest, the, I feel like a, a, a major reason for it is, hey, listen, if these guys are doing it, we're gonna get a bunch of 13 and 14 year olds starting to do this, and and trying to work themselves to to a point where they can hit a ball 400 feet, it's going to be the same thing with college baseball. When a story like this breaks out this time of year, you do have kids watching. You do have high school and junior high kids who are paying attention to college baseball because they have a desire to play at that level. They're watching this and they're going, "Well, he didn't do anything illegal, so why can't I do something like this?" This guy's going to be a top three draft pick. So that's a story that busted out this weekend that I do feel is is important to what the game is now in terms of on the field. Carolina looked gassed. You know, guys, you've talked about it and, and what Mike Fox had to do and, and some of the choices that he made, especially in that 13-inning game, were very questionable. Uh, that game may not have gone 13 innings had he not made some of those choices because Florida Atlantic was able to come back. Uh, that's hindsight, and it's easy to, to criticize that now, but I think it's important to, to note that Carolina did look a little gassed. Uh, their catcher, Matt Roberts, is out now. And he caught a great series, uh, to his credit. He's out with a broken finger, so he's not going to play in the Super Regionals as far as we know right now. Uh, I think that's something to, to, to take a look at as well. I think Florida State's, I don't want to say a lock. Uh, I, I do think Indiana can give them some problems offensively, but if their pitching staff holds up, man, I just don't see Florida State losing uh, before they get to Omaha. I, don't, I see them kind of knocking it out in two, ga uh, in two games in Tallahassee. Um, I'm really excited about LSU Oklahoma. Like I said, I think that might be the best atmosphere. That might be the best matchup. They've got the A team there. Mike Patrick and Kyle Peterson are going to be there for the call of it. And and you know, just uh, again, outsider looking in, you kind of get the sense if that's the A team, that's a pretty compelling regional, uh, compelling super regional that we've got on our air this weekend. So I'm really pumped about that. I think Virginia Mississippi State could be a really underrated regional. I think a lot of people may just kind of write that off and and not really know much about Mississippi State. Uh, you know they they had a bit of a down year this year, but uh, in comparison to where they've been in the past, because they were a one, um, they were a two, uh, they, they, but they didn't work up to a one seed this year. Hunter Renfro is a blast to watch. He's must watch television at all times. And Virginia, as good as they are in their pitching staff, they're third in the country in runs. And Mississippi State prides itself the last couple of seasons on its pitching. That could be a really really underrated regional. And uh, I mean I know it's all chalk. I know it's not maybe as fun as, as it has been in years past, and I saw last year with Stony Brook uh, making it to, uh, to the College World Series. I had Kent State in Eugene making its first ever College World Series, and those stories are fun. But, man, this is a fun time of year, just like the NCAA basketball tournament. You know, you love the upsets early, but when you get down to the nitty-gritty, you want to see some chalk because you want to see where, where the big boys are going to be playing and how they're going to be pitching and how their lineups are going to be formulated. So that's, uh, that's what I'm looking forward to this weekend. Hey Adam, man, I appreciate you. I know you're. It's a busy time of year for you. You kind of winding down, but thanks for jumping on with us. We'll have to give you a hard time about the Cubs some other time. But uh, <laughs> thanks for jumping on, Adam Amin at ESPNU, covered the Tallahassee Regional, gave us a little insight on some college baseball. Appreciate it, Ryan Shotgun. all thanks, man. All right, Adam Amin. If you want to stick around, Adam, you're welcome to do it. Otherwise, I know you got things to get to. We got to jump right into the regionals here. Uh, we talked a little bit about North Carolina guys. How does that super shape up with them against the Gamecocks? If they play this weekend with the weather, the weather issues are going to be major. They got a, a chocolate storm going through um, North Carolina this weekend, so 
I don't know when that series is actually going to be played. That's, we're going to have major issues there. I think North Carolina, if they can get any pitching, is going to be able to do it. But, you know, South Carolina, every year, every postseason, they've always in Omaha, so we got to watch out. That team's, you know, loaded with a lot of veteran talent, and we'll see what happens. Well, you, this storm is going to be, going to be huge for not only when they play, but, you know, that's going to – if they get pushed back a day or two – that's an extra day of rest, an extra two days of rest. All of a sudden, North Carolina's pitching staff is back at 100%. So this could have a huge impact on the series um, because North Carolina, all of a sudden, they go from being pitching woes to pitching strength again if they can get back healthy um, with, with a couple days extra off with, with too much rain. Uh, it'll be fun. It's going to be fun series to see a uh, South Carolina coach going back, uh, facing off against his alma mater. So, uh SEC versus ACC, the two always go back and forth in college baseball about who's better. Now we'll get to we'll, – this is one of the premier matchups to find out who is. All right, let's jump over to the other side of the bracket. The number two, Vanderbilt, uh, will host Louisville, and hopefully that doesn't get affected by weather. But Vandy, they took a loss in their regional. Louisville did not. A lot of people were questioning – I won't say a lot of people, I'll say myself. I was questioning Louisville. I thought maybe one of the other teams, Oklahoma State, maybe could squeeze out of there. Louisville, Louisville was able to hold serve. How will they fare against the Commodores heading out to Nashville for that one? Um, Louisville Vandy's become one of the better college baseball rivalries the last couple of years. You know, they're always matching up in regional, super regional. Um, Louisville's offense was good this past weekend against Miami. You know, they took care of business in Oklahoma State. So I think if Louisville gets any type of pitching, they could possibly knock off the Commodores. I really, you know, I still think Van- Vandy's going to be able to take it in two games, but you got to watch out for Louisville. they got some decent arms. Dice Kame and those type of guys. Uh, Jeff Thompson's a monster. I'm 6'6", 250, just an absolute beast out there. He can shut teams down. He was an all-star in the KP. He was outstanding down there. Everybody that saw him down in Cape thought the kid was great. You know, I saw him in the NECBL All-Star game. The kid was same thing, he's solid. So he's a he's a guy who doesn't get a lot of press down there from Louisville. So, you know, I know Tyler Beattie and um, Kevin Zomack, uh, you know, one, two, starting pitches. One of them had a bad day against Thompson. Now you're down, down a, you have to sweep the next two games to get by him. So, you know, it's not as easy as everyone thinks. I think Super Regional is actually tougher to win than, you know, the regionals, in my own opinion. It should be a fun series, like you said, especially yeah. uh, with Thompson matching up uh, against either Zemeck or, uh, or Beattie. Um, that game is just going to be phenomenal. I don't even think those guys, those Vanderbilt pitchers, had to have an off day. Thompson's that good. That, uh, we could have a, a classic 1-0, 2-1 game uh, in, that, in that one. And we'll see, you know, how much damage that Louisville offense can do against Vanderbilt's vaunted pitching staff. And, and Vanderbilt, you know, though they did lose to Georgia Tech, they, they pretty much walked through uh, that series besides the one game in Georgia Tech. Louisville had one close game against Miami, but they walked through the, their other two games. So both of these teams should be nice and rested coming in and ready to go. And we'll see uh, another – future ACC versus SEC matchup when Louisville moves over. All right, let's jump to Raleigh, North Carolina, where North Carolina State, the Wolfpack, they ruled through their they rolled through their region 3 and 0 and that one they'll face one of the non-number 1 teams, Rice, who came out of that Eugene region. So North Carolina State and Rice Conference USA getting some love here in the Supers. Um, yeah, you know, the same old thing. NC State, whether or not voting, you know, everybody's saying, you know, the kid's back to 100%. You know, number one pitch in the country for next year, so no doubt about it. The kid has got to be, this is the time he's got to shine, and he's got to be able to shut down Vice on Friday night. I think um, Cubez is going to pitch against him, you know, whenever game one happens. So, but that's going to be, I think that's going to be a great pitching matchup on the first game of the series. Whenever is it, that's is. another that's another weather issue, right? Yeah, that's country. another weather issue. So they're right down there in North Carolina. And plus the other thing in North Carolina and NC State, they both play on grass. They don't play on turf like some of these other teams. So, you know, if there's a really bad rainstorm, it could cause issues in the field. You know. Hey, Shotgun, does, does Rice stand a chance here? Is they have a puncher's chance to win this one? I think this is actually one of the least compelling matchups in this series because I think that NC State – if they can get the starting pitching behind Rodon, uh, which has been a kind of a question mark all season, they're just that much better than uh, Rice. Uh, Rice 
kind of underperformed all season, but they're playing hot at the right time. Them and Oklahoma, you know, teams that were expected to dominate their conference, and they didn't do that, but they finished up the season strong. They're playing well in the postseason. So it's not always about how well you played during the season, but how when you get hot. And they're pretty hot right now, so maybe they can they can uh, uh, make some noise down there in Raleigh. And uh, if Kubica comes back, he just pitched in the uh, in the final game in Oregon. Uh, if they bring him back, that may that's on what three three days rest if they play on Friday. So uh, that'll be interesting to see whether they bring him back on Friday or try to just, or wait till Saturday. Um, do you? If if they don't pitch him, do you just you know throw your number three or something to the Wolves against Rodon and hope you can win the next two games? Uh, uh, because Rice isn't doesn't have a, a ton of offense down there, and especially if you're going up against a Rodon that's on, then there's going to be some trouble in that first game. Let's jump to Brian Foley's favorite team, the Florida State Seminoles and the Indiana Hoosiers. A matchup with the ACC and the Big Ten. They'll be playing in Tallahassee. Is this just set up for the Seminoles to roll to the College World Series, Brian? Absolutely. I don't think Indiana's going to be able to hang with them. You know, I talked to a couple of scouts this week, and they were not impressed by Indiana's offense at all. So, you know, I'm just saying from the point of view, they were really more impressed by Austin P. They thought Austin P was a better hitting team right now, but – you know, it doesn't matter what I what scouts say and stuff like that. It depends on what happens in the game. So, you know, Indiana, you know, they're a good, solid Big Ten team. You know, they went at the big, best Big Ten team I, I heard, in the, you know, from scouts in the conference. So I still think FSU, you know, with that offense, in playing at Dick Houses Stadium is a great environment for them. And, you know, if, I know Indiana's played a couple times at FSU in the past couple years. But it's still you got to be able to do it in the super regional. I don't think Indiana is going to be able to do it. I like this matchup. I like mm-hmm. Indiana for an upset here. I like Donato mm-hmm. at the front of the rotation for the Hoosiers, and the Hoosiers are used to going on the road. They've been doing it for the last three years in the early season. They've gone to they've gone to Florida. They've gone to California. They're used to being on the road. They know all about it. They're up for this. They've got a, a, a very uh, veteran lineup. They're going to put this one together. The Hoosiers, I'm calling it, the Hoosiers are going to take this one. Calling the upset right here. No That'll way. That would be a huge soundbite if they actually pull it off their shotgun. If they pull that off, I, I will take that video and put it everywhere all across the internet. It's <laughs> <laughs> so a shotgun going for the upset. IU, Tom Crean going to give them some mojo. The basketball school over the football school into the College World Series. And hey, oh, I think I think Florida State's a basketball school now. They've been pretty good in hoops lately. That's true. They've been better in hoops lately. You, you, the Seminoles, come on, you know they're you know they're a football school. Uh, I know, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. Let's jump to a let's jump to another ACC team. Virginia hosting Mississippi State. Um, Adam Amin came on. He thought this is going to be a, a pretty solid regional. What do you guys think? Uh, Virginia out of the ACC, Mississippi State out of the ACC, uh, SEC. Another ACC SEC matchup there in Charlottesville. I think Mississippi State actually goes into Charlottesville and wins. I was unimpressed by Virginia. I know Virginia swept that um, regional, but they didn't really play that well. I didn't think. I thought, you know, you know, they, I thought their regional actually turned out to be one of the easiest ones. You know, with Elon, UNC Wilmington, you know, both those teams really didn't do much for me. You know, I watched bits and pieces of that series, and I was I wasn't impressed with Virginia. They won a two one game against I know our boy Chris Wiley at Army, but. You know, everything else was just, ugh, I just wasn't impressed at all. I was like, you know, you got to be able to beat Ami a lot better than that. you got to be able to beat, you know, Wilmington. you got to be able to beat Elon. I just don't, I wasn't impressed by him. So, I like Mississippi State. You know, Central Arkansas played very hard against Mississippi State and gave them, a, you know, gave them two good games. Central Arkansas, I thought, was a better team. than Central Arkansas was ridiculous. So, I don't know. I think Mississippi State takes it. I think Renfro's, you know, going to be able to find some hitting, so. Let's see what happens. This series is a matchup of two teams that I feel like have been overlooked in their conference. Even though Virginia is a you know the, the number five or uh, it's a national seed number six I believe. Uh, even though they've been you know a national seed, they're not the ones getting the pub. It's North Carolina, North Carolina State. Um, you know, in the SEC, it's LSU and Vanderbilt. Mississippi State's been talked about by Mississippi State fans because. That's all the state of Mississippi talks about is SEC sports. But outside of Mississippi, you know, who's necessarily been talking about them? You've got Hunter Renfro, and you've got some talent on both these teams. But for how talented they are, I think they've been greatly overlooked. 
And I think this could end up being one of the you know better series just because you know these are two teams that are hungry and just nobody is talking about them. And you know, one of them is going to be in Omaha, and I think they'll whichever team comes out of this series will make a little bit of noise in Omaha as well. All right, we move on. Uh, no we respect. Go to- no respect. <laughs> You awful. You awful. awful. You want to say something, Brian? No. No, I didn't want to say anything. I just said shotguns are awful. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> shotguns got to pull that out all the time. Which one? What do you, you got? Pull know, out? Spec card. <laughs> well, you know, if it works, it works for you. It works for you. You know, if you're going to Omaha, what does it matter? Let's jump to Corvallis, Oregon State, Kansas State. Great story out of Manhattan. The joyride ends in Corvallis, right, gentlemen? Yep, it's over in Cor- Corvallis. I will, you know, Kansas State can hit, and they can hit some more, but, you know, coming up against Matt Boyd on Fridays, it's going to be, you know, first game is going to be tough for them. So I don't think Kansas State's going to be able to do it. I was impressed by the freshman closer, though. Kansas State's freshman closer, in the key situation, was able to take Arkansas out, and, you know, he was able to show good poise out there for freshmen. So I was very impressed by him. The, Oregon this could State, be a fun series, though. They were on the ropes yeah. a couple times against uh, Santa Barbara. Had them on the rope shotgun. They were able to come through three to, three and zero in their region. Are they one of the favorites to go to Omaha here? I think they're one of the favorites, but th- this could be a fun series because you've got the pitching of Oregon State, and Oregon State's you know got a dynamite pitching staff depth for days against the hitting of Kansas State, and Kansas State puts twenty runs up in their the first game of the regional, and not like they were playing a a slob of a team there, um, a, a four seed. They had Wichita State. But, uh, you know, this could be fun to see the offense versus deep, uh, uh, offense versus pitching. And a lot of times the pitching will come out in that, and I think that's what's going to happen this weekend. All right, let's move over. Adam Amin talked about this one. Uh, it should be a huge one if you know anything about Alex Box Stadium. PSLs. They sold PSLs to build that thing, and they had to turn people away. Louisiana State, Oklahoma – the 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 the, uh, the Tigers the Bayou Bengals they have a huge fan base there. Oklahoma comes in obviously with the two studs on the mound. Is this the best super uh, that's on the board right now, gentlemen? It's the best matchup. It's going to be absolutely you know with Gray and Overton pitching um, games one and game two. You know Oklahoma's got a good chance of shutting out you know shutting down the LSU offense. So you know I know they got to face Nola, but. I think Oklahoma's going to be able to go down there and take, you know, win the Super Regional. You know, Stony Brook went down there, so anything's possible. Anybody can win a, an Alex Box, and Stony Brook can go in there and take. Should have won three games at LSU last year. They won all, basically won all three games at LSU last year. Besides a kid dropping a fly ball in left field. That's how they lost one of the games. I guess this is my third most compelling series this weekend. First, That's I got uh, Indiana taking out Florida State. Second, the series we still haven't talked about. And then third, not that to say that this is not a tremendous series. And uh, I'm just looking forward to the other two series a little bit more, just a little bit. This is going to be a great series. Oklahoma going down there. They finally get hot. They're finally playing up to their potential. you got this great distraction. Does he come back and, and pitch great? And Gray and Overton both are guys that could go in the draft today. So those are uh, – you know, there's always that question – that Friday night, Saturday, with those guys that are first and second day draft guys, does that distract them at all? And we see it every year. If you think about it, you see it every single year. There's a couple guys, you know, if they slip a little bit, a couple rounds lower than they, they expected to go or were projected to go, if they don't pitch as well or they don't play as well, they don't have that great weekend because there's that distraction. This is the only sport, the only college sport where it'd be like uh, someone said uh, on Twitter yesterday, it'd be like the NFL draft coming – the day before the Super Bowl, you know, it just completely could distract players. Um, uh, or excuse me, the, the on Christmas or New Year's Eve, the day before the uh, big uh, college bowl, the bowl games, or the MLB uh, or the NBA having their draft the, uh, the the day of the the day in between the Final Four and the final game. I mean, this just doesn't happen in other sports. So there's that just an extra element of distraction there that could go on. Does that affect Oklahoma with their studs? Or they come out focused and Gray wants to shove it to show everybody, and they just put it right to LSU. And playing in front of that, that, that crowd is going to be just uh, an amazing experience uh, down there. 
between those two teams. It should be rowdy. There should be plenty of Oklahoma fans that travel out. There were some Oklahoma fans out here last year when they played Pepperdine, and they brought a pretty good contingent out. Granted, you know, who wouldn't want to come out to Malibu for a little vacation in, uh, in February, uh, early, late February, early March. So, uh, but it should be a fun, rowdy series. And, and, but unfortunately, only number three on my list. Only number three. No, the other thing with Gray being the number one guy, you know, number one, one B, whatever, whatever he gets picked is that the number one guy never pitches well in Supers or in the College World Series. It's really, you know, ben, going back to like 1990, Ben McDonald got absolutely blitzed in Omaha a few times. So, you know, McDonald was supposed to be the best pitcher in the country, and he absolutely got blitzed. I remember that back when I was even young. Yo, this kid McDonald was supposed to be the greatest thing in the world. He couldn't get it all the play. Couldn't get anybody out. It's the same type of thing. It's been going on for years. Appel last year at Florida State. It happens all the time. Yeah, Strasburg, it happens every time. These guys are supposed to be a superstar, and they never get it done. It's just it's weird. It's that it's extra weird. pressure. I mean, you're yeah. putting this on a, a 21-year-old kid to go out there and, and show the world what you can do, and, you know, this is the biggest stage that they've been on. Some people fold underneath that or until they get a little bit more experience. The more times you're in the situation, the, more, the, the better and better you're going to get, and the first time you're thrown into that, how do you react? Yeah, Mike Leake's another one. Mike Leake got, you know, he had eight nothing lead against Texas in the College World Series, and all of a sudden, this is the third inning. Now it's an 88 game. You have eight runs like that, like, you know, flash. And the kid was up in the major leagues by the end of that year. So, I don't know. I mean, it's just it happens. Well, the next one we're going to give homage to LL Cool J or uh, Notorious B.I.G., depending on your uh, your demographic. Going, going back to Cali. Cali, um, we'll go to... Goodwin Field, Cal State Fullerton, Big West hosting the Pac-12, the Titans and the Bruins tusks up against uh, the uh, the baby blue of UCLA. John Savage matching wits with Rich Vanderhoek. There's or with Rick Vanderhoek. There are so many stories on this regional, gentlemen. The Bruins and the Titans. How's it going to end up, Ryan? I like Fulton. I first time I had a chance to see Fulton was this past weekend, and Ashelman and that whole pitching staff was. Ridiculous! It was no. I couldn't believe how good they looked. Um, I love Lavenza, and I've loved Lavenza for two years. So I love his game. You know, be able to come in as a close like that too. So I like Fulton in that regional. You know, question for me is whether or not Fulton's got a good enough offense. That's the, my biggest question. You know, they probably do, but I love those three freshmen. Fulton's going to be a force for three years with those guys out there. And- Shotgun knows more than I do. About yeah, that, I mean, so. sh- sh- I mean, a shotgun. This is kind of your bailiwick here. We were both at Jackie yeah. Robinson Stadium over the weekend. We saw the Bruins, and I, you know, I saw Fullerton this year. I obviously have tremendous respect for Coach Vanderhoek and that program out of the Big West, and they do have a solid pitching staff. But do you got a feeling about UCLA the way they're able to throw the ball? And that was a tough regional. They had the teams that came in there with Cal Poly San Diego and San Diego State. So their 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 starters got tested a little bit. I thought they came through pretty well on that regional shotgun. They, they got tested, and uh, I want to move here because i got to re- re-plug in get some uh, more juice on the computer. But they got tested, and they didn't throw great. Nick Vandertag and, and Adam Plutko, they're two guys that have been quality guys for them all season and for the last couple of years. They didn't throw great, but they, they grinded. That was something that was said in both press conferences. The word grind came up. Um, uh, Plutko said it about himself. And then Coach Savage said it about Vandertag. They grinded and got through those games. And granted, it's not the same offense that they're going to see this weekend with Fullerton. Fullerton can hit the ball. They've got guys throughout the lineup. They can they can do a little bit of everything. You got some power in the middle with J.D. Davis and Chad Wallach and Lorenzen and uh, you know Carlos Lopez even has shown power this season in their in their two hole spot. So they've got a quality lineup through and through. They do a, a true straight uh, the last month or two. They've done a, a true um, platoon in the outfield. They're left and right fielders. It just depends on they'll they'll see uh, you know Clay Williamson and uh, Austin Deemer are their right-handed hitters. We'll see them on Sunday on, on uh, Friday and Saturday, or if we get to Sunday on Friday and Saturday, you'll see uh, Anthony Hudding and Austin Kingsolver out there. So they got a true platoon between those. And, and I talked to Coach Vanderhoek early in the year, and he said that was going to be one of the biggest issues he's going to have is who's going to play in the outfield because he's got so much talent and so much depth on that team this season. And like you said, the, the pitching is just ridiculous. 
they went through the three games of the regional without yet again without a walk. 27 innings, no walks in that. I believe they gave up two runs the entire weekend. Uh, you know, they're they're a special pitching staff, but it's going to be fun. So much fun to see the two freshmen, Eshelman and Garza. You're going to have Garza going uh, because of the way the rotation got set up. He's going to be the Friday night guy. This is going to be his first time starting on Friday night. Uh, how does he deal with the pressure as a as a freshman, first timer on on Friday night, going up against Plutko, the veteran who's been in the College World Series before, the guy that was behind uh, Garrett Cole and, and Trevor Bauer on Sundays for that team that that uh, that when he was a freshman, and then you know he's got the experience last year in the College World Series. Vander Tag's got College World Series experience. You got these two veteran uh, pitchability guys, guys that are you know that. They got hit a little bit this weekend, but they still, they know how to pitch. They know how to to make the adjustments. They know how to do that. Those two guys, the veteran juniors against the two freshmen, it's just going to be fun to watch, and I'm looking forward to it so much being down there this weekend. And then you've got uh, Fullerton's got the better um, lineup and everything, but UCLA's bullpen is, you know, Rich Hill is one to, to, you know, Give a little, go a little over the top, exaggerate a little bit, a little hyperbole. But he called it, you know, one of the greatest bullpens in college baseball history. Now that might that be a little, Rich, Rich, little Hill, too much. Rich Hill said that, right? Yeah, Rich Hill from San Diego said that in his post game press conference. That might be a little bit too much, but man, they were so good in the uh, in the regional. You got Caprillion coming in um, the, on Saturday and Sunday. They didn't give up a hit uh, between the bullpen didn't, and I believe five and a third innings. I don't think they they allowed a runner. You got David Berg at the at the back end, and we talked about him before. You know, just just filthy stuff from him. And then you got Caprillion in front of him, who was going to be the closer this year, the freshman, throwing 93, 94, 95, maybe uh, power arm, power slider, great stuff. Uh, you know, he comes in, and he can give you two innings, three innings if need be. You got uh, Zach, Zach Weiss, Weiss is, is, is kind of overlooked in that bullpen, but another great guy with a, with a power. Uh, sinker and everything you know so they've got a little bit better bullpen than Fullerton and I'm doing it right now I'm doing a breakdown uh position by position uh in this series and we'll see you know who comes out in that breakdown which you can catch later on uh college baseball daily probably tomorrow morning maybe later this evening we'll, we'll see how much free time I get at work today but hey, um shotgun but let me uh, UCLA I believe they're hitting 250 as a team has true. there been a team I mean and, and you know and listen I mean I know how Fullerton's very good I think we can both agree that's going to be a tough, a tough series that either team could win it. Has there been a team in recent memory that you know of that has had such struggles offensively that seemingly put themselves in a position to get to Omaha the way the Bruins have done this year under John Savage with that pitching staff? I mean, every year there's a couple teams that are just, you know, if you had those dominant arms, you don't have to put up too much, too much uh, uh, runs on the board, and right. especially when you have a bullpen as strong as UCLA, is that they've won – I believe they've given up less than two runs like 20, 28 times now, I want to say, something like that. That's, that's half their games. Half their games, you, all you got to score is three runs. I mean, that's not that much to ask in the college game. And the offense, you know, they, they put together good at bats. They, they do the small things. They might not always get the hits, but they, they do just enough. And this weekend, you know, you get a little bit of luck, and, and they'll run with it. You know, they have the bases loaded, and the ball gets lost in the sky. In the, in the night sky at, at uh, dusk, in the lights, it goes for a three-run triple. All of a sudden, they have been no hit going into that inning against Cal Poly's uh, Matt Emoff, and they tie it up right there. The next inning, they take the lead. They turn it over the bullpen, they, and uh, Cal Poly in that game didn't get a hit after the fourth inning. I mean, that's the type of pitching staff. You give them just a little bit, and then they'll, they'll run with it, and they'll, you know, they'll keep you ahead in the game. So uh, that's – all they've got to do is just get a couple head, runs ahead, and I think that's how this series will play out. You know, one mistake here, one mistake there is going to be determine who's going to be going to uh, to Omaha this season. Last question for you, Shotgun, on this series. What do you think of Hookie's strategy? He's going to throw Justin Garza on Friday. He threw Graham Weast on Friday last year. That worked out. Will he be able to do it two times, two weekends in a row? Well, the, the biggest deal is uh, he wanted to get those freshmen back at the front of the rotation – and Eshelman started on, on Sunday this past week, so he didn't want him going on short rest, uh, especially. They've been, you know, they a lot of times it's talked about the, the freshman wall. You know, will freshman pitchers run into that wall? 
they've done such a tremendous job, you know, uh, curtailing how much these guys pitch. I think the most either of them pitched is like 105 pitches or something really low. Neither one of them's got close to 110 pitches this season. Uh, I don't even know if Eshelman's even made it to 100 yet this season. And that says so much about him. He's got complete games. He's, he's routinely gone seven, eight, nine innings, and he has yet to throw 100 pitches that I know of. So, you know, he's been tremendous. That's why uh, when you only walk two people in a season so far, then you're not going to throw that many pitches. He does a tremendous job. Even though he, he's not a, you know, 94, 95-mile-an-hour guy, he's topping out at 88, 89. I don't, I don't know that he's even hit 90 this year. Uh, maybe he has. But he just attacks hitters and goes after them, uses his changeup great. You know, he's a guy that you love to watch pitch, even though he doesn't have the most explosive stuff because he knows how to pitch and he's aggressive and he, he's a freshman, but he doesn't care. He just, he'll go after you. He'll go, I don't care who you are, just coming to the box. Uh, put Griffey Jr. in his heyday up there and Eshelman's going after him. That's the best thing about him. He's his. He just attacks guys, and as we were talking about earlier, it's about whether or not the kid can pitch. You know, and the kid can pitch. That's the main thing. He's not going to blow guys away. The kid can pitch. It's great to watch, and it's, it's great to watch on TV because the game's over quickly. <laughs> That's the other best point. It's a quick even game. when even when the game starts at nine forty five p.m. Pacific time, and it's one nothing game. What a what a tremendous game that was on Saturday between Justin Garza. Great freshman matchup between Justin Garza and Arizona State's Ryan Kellogg. Uh, Kellogg didn't have his best stuff, but but pitched through it. But Fullerton got one run in the sixth, and that was all it needed. Garza got a huge strikeout in the eighth and in there uh, with a runner on third base. He gives up a single in the ninth, and then Lorenzen comes in just you know just revving it up, had the juices flowing, strikes out the only two guys he faces with 98, 90 mile an hour, uh, you know, cheese coming in there. So. I'm looking forward. This is gonna. This is the series that I'm looking forward to most. I know the most compelling is going to be Indiana, Florida State when Indiana wins. But this is the one I'm definitely looking forward to, and I'm gonna be. I'm so excited that I'm gonna be there this weekend. Um, last shock and last thing on this series. I I got a feeling this one's gonna come down to the bullpens, and that was one of the few weaknesses for Fullerton. Not that they don't have talent on the bullpen, because they do. It just hasn't been as consistent as the bullpen has been for UCLA. I think for UCLA, they had seven guys throw more than ten innings on the year. And that was their main, obviously their four weekly starters and three guys out of the bullpen that we've already talked about, Weiss, Caprillion, and the hammer at the end of the bullpen, David Berg. Uh, how do you think the series shapes up? Who do you think wins? Uh, I, I don't think it necessarily comes down to the bullpen. Uh, and if it does, if these guys go into extra innings, that then it then it shifts to UCLA's favor. Um, I think it's going to come down to just one or two mistakes. You know, whether it be an error or maybe it's a, a pitch left up or something, and somebody does something with it, um, then I think that's going to be the biggest difference. I think it's just going to be something small. Somebody doesn't get a bunt down and it pops up a bunt and turns into a double play, runs somebody out of an inning, something like that. Or somebody doesn't field a bunt correctly and all of a sudden uh, and a big inning comes out of it or something like that. I think it, this this series is so tight uh, that these two teams are playing so well right now that it's going to be something small that it's going to be the determining, determining factor. And Cal State Fullerton has already beat UCLA twice this season if, if – they can continue to do what they've done. Granted, both of those were midweek games. We're going to see the, the big arms on the weekend. The Cal State Fullerton, Vanderhook knows the UCLA. You know, he was assistant coach there for three years uh, before taking over the Fullerton job last year. He knows that that roster. They He's pressed all the right buttons so far this year. The, the players are, are used to him this year. They're used to the way he goes about things, and I think – They've won 51 games. That's pretty impressive. I mean, 51 and 8 coming into this series. I think they're they're the the favorite in this for sure, just because they've done it all year. And you know, we'll see how well those freshmen hold up going against the juniors. That that'll be the biggest matchup of the weekend. If nothing else, guys, uh, it's going to be an exciting weekend. We're not we're not going to have time to talk draft. I'll we'll have to come back and do a draft show maybe this weekend or early next week. But Give me, each of you, give me a final thought going forth into the Super Regionals. Obviously a great weekend last weekend. Will this weekend match up? Brian. Absolutely not. You know, we only got like, I think we only got like 
35 games we'll see this weekend. So it's a lot less games, so it won't be as exciting because it'll just be – it's all the big-name big, big name teams. And we don't have no, like, um, Dave versus Goliath anymore with um, no Stony Brook, no Kent State to root for to get into the postseason. You know, best – David reference you can do right now is Kansas State because no one's giving Kansas State a shot to win that log on State. So, you know, there's no little guy to root for. for oh, the come on. Give the Big Ten some credit. They're a little guy. Hey, come on. I don't think Indiana, you know, Indiana's been a good team all year. I just don't. I Anybody don't. from the North a little guy, just like you, <laughs> little guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I am, I'm not the biggest guy, so <laughs> – Brian's all focused on the Bruins now, anyway. The, the yeah, Bruins hey, we, hey one, one win away from the cup. It's it's all about the cup, so. Hey, <laughs> college baseball, baby. That's where we're at right here. <laughs> yeah, how, how about, I mean, that Rice, could be, Rice could be a little team that, that you could root for, perhaps. I mean, they're one of the, the one of the two number two seeds that advance. So, Rice out of Conference USA. <laughs> so, that a little bit. We got Fulton out of the Big West, although they are kind of a perennial power. Hey, out who, of a non who wants little guys? Play. Give me these compelling matchups. I want to see... I want to see North Carolina, South Carolina. I want to see UCLA Fullerton. And uh, going back to UCLA Fullerton, one last point on that series. You know, is this the changing of the guard? I mean, UCLA the la- has has been in the you know the College World Series two of the last three years or, or whatever it is. You know, are they the team taking over in Southern California? Because Fullerton, you know, if they don't win this, this will be, I believe, the first group of four. If you're a four-year senior, I think this will be the first time. Not a to go to the college senior World group does not go to Omaha. So that's yeah. that's a huge thing in the, in the Fullerton tradition. You know, if if guys like Lorenzen and Carlos Lopez, you know, those those type of guys, if they don't go to the College World Series, you know, two thousand nine shotgun, two thousand nine, right? Last time Fullerton went to Omaha was in 09? I believe so. Yeah, don't don't quote me on years. I always mix up years. So hey, but, uh, last time I was last time I was in Omaha, I met Jason Windsor, and he wasn't too he wasn't stable. Put it that way. <laughs> Jason Windsor from Fold. He was a little he was a little tipsy. Let's be honest. I was like, whoa. Me and Mark were like, whoa. This guy's got a little bit of liquid in him. Liquid coverage. Put it that way. <laughs> and the, and these two teams played in 2010, and UCLA won that to go to the College World Series. So that's the last time they matched up. And that, that series, uh, Fullerton was one out away. One out away. And Tyler Ramatula oh, hits a, ho- a two-run homer, and they end up winning in ten innings. And then they went on Sunday to take it. And, of course, Ramatula doesn't make it to the College World Series because he breaks his arm in the, uh, in the dog pile. Yeah, this is the third time they'll meet in the regional. UCLA's 1-1, Fullerton's 1-1. So this is kind of the rubber match. And, you know, the, the, I think, I don't know, and I know you love this shotgun because you're a big guy talking to coaches. The Savage-Vanderhook matchup to me is incredibly intriguing as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, a, a complete di- uh, opposite ends of the personality spectrum uh, because, you know, Vanderhook is not afraid to tell his guys what he thinks at all times. And he's, he's a very open guy, and I, I love the fact that how candy he is. And he'll tell you if, if, if whatever it may be, if, if you're pissing him off, he's going to let you know that you're pissing him off. Um, and Savage is, is so, you know, when he's speaking, he's so calm, cool, collected. You know, you, you rarely ever hear him even yelling uh, on the field at anybody. You know, he just goes about it so well. And he's done Polish. such a tremendous job recruiting in, in Southern California. It, that's you know that's why I think this series could be almost the changing of the guard. We'll see. I think both of these programs are in great shape to continue for uh, years upon years right now with those two guys leading the way, though. All right, gentlemen, uh, it's been a good run. We'll have to come back very very soon to go over these these matchups. But Shotgun Spratling will be in Fullerton all weekend. Brian Foley will be covering from the East Coast the majority of the regions. Uh, great college baseball coming up. College baseball day. The meeting on the mound. Super Regionals coming up this week. Thank you, Shotgun. Thank you, Brian Foley. Thank you, Adam Amin, for joining us for a few minutes. My name is Gazala Hassan. So long, everybody.